Welcome aboard the most scenic train in the United States, Amtrak's California Zephyr. Hello, jet setters and rail fans. I'm Jeb Brooks from greenergrass.com. Right now, I'm in Chicago. It's time to head over to San Francisco, and I'm traveling on board the most scenic train in the United States. This is the California Zephyr. This train passes through seven states, over 2,438 miles in a scheduled 51 and a half hours. We'll climb to nearly 10,000 feet and spend two nights on board. After a two o'clock departure on Wednesday from the Windy City, we plan to arrive at 425 on Friday afternoon in Emeryville, just outside San Francisco. We were traveling in late April 2021, when the weather in Chicago can be predictably unpredictable. A sign of what was to come on this trip? I was not traveling alone. My enthusiasm for Amtrak sparked interest from a few of my friends who you'll get to know over the course of our trip out west. That's Sean, Craig, and Alan, and all of us headed to Union Station to begin our journey. We got our start at this beautiful, historic train station. Stepping into this train station, it just is a real sense of occasion. It feels um, as magnificent as this journey is gonna be. Truly the right way to start something like this. As, uh, as you look around at this absolutely magnificent room. Our first stop was the Metropolitan Lounge. All passengers booked into sleeper car services uh, are granted access to this lounge, which is really nice, a great place to sort of settle in and get ready for your trip. The lounge offers plenty of seating for kids and adults. There are showers and even bag storage. There are also places to charge up and knock out some work. Unfortunately, during our visit, there was no food on offer. First meal on the Zephyr is dinner, so we're going to grab a quick bite to eat here at the station. Uh, so we've got a little food in us before we begin the journey. Thankfully, Union Station has plenty of options for hungry travelers. We each grabbed a bite from different restaurants and then found a table sitting together. There's a nearby convenience store to visit before the long trip. Union Station is fantastic. I could have spent a lot more time in here exploring. Here's the waiting area for coach passengers. But it was this map of Amtrak's route network that really caught my attention. It really gave me a sense of the vast swath of the country we'd be traveling. We returned to the lounge just before boarding began. Train 5 is boarding, track 18, here we come. Zephyr's about to kick off. The anticipation is real. This is, uh, I mean, boarding anything is exciting, uh, but a long haul train is something special. Unlike my previous experiences on Amtrak, there were plenty of employees there to show us the way to our rooms. Now, we'd each booked our own room. Two guys chose roomettes, and two of us chose bedrooms. We'll explore both room types on this trip. And that brings up one of the greatest benefits of a sleeper car. It's our dedicated sleeping car attendant. Ours was fantastic. He was so kind and enthusiastic, ready to support us in any way he could. Without much effort, I found my room, C, in the sleeper car closest to the dining car. Made it, smooth as silk, just getting settled in here, and then once we get going, we'll take a look around the room, but it feels like home. It's amazing just how many moving pieces and parts are required to make one of these massive machines work. A successful trip depends on so much. But when I noticed our two o'clock departure time had slipped past, I thought maybe one of them wasn't cooperating. There's a leaking shower and they're having to move the people who are in the room with the shower forward, but the concern is we'll run out of water because uh, they can't figure out how to stop the leaking. So hopefully they sort all this out, but uh, your guess is as good as mine at this point. It's probably about 10 minutes late because of that uh, shower mishap, but I guess they sorted it out. Hopefully we won't, we won't run out of water. Time will tell, but uh, we're headed out of Chicago. The Zephyr's name derives from the Greek god of the western wind, Zephyrus so it felt good to be blowing out of the station on our westward journey. Now, this seemed like a good time to familiarize myself with the room. Amtrak offers a number of sleeping accommodations on these long-haul trains. Should I put together a video highlighting the pros and cons of each one? Let me know. For now, this bedroom can easily offer sufficient space for two adults to sleep. 
Now, the four of us were comfortable hanging out here during the day. The sofa converts to a bed that's a little wider than a twin, and the upper bunk folds down, but it's not quite as wide. There's a closet, which was ideal given the changing weather conditions we'd experience on this journey. It was great to have easy access to my coat. It's possible to adjust the room's temperature here, where there's also a plug and a reading light. Amtrak stocks bedrooms with a number of pillows, but I still brought my own all the way from home. There's a chair, a mirror, and luggage storage right here. There's also another light, call button, and adjustment for the in-room speaker over there by the sofa. The bedroom also includes a sink, along with one million other tasks he completed. Our room attendant helpfully emptied the trash can every day as well. The table made me feel gratitude for the extra United Airlines sanitizing wipe I'd picked up on my trip to Chicago. This was uh, pretty disgusting. There's still another reading light over the chair. There's a bathroom and a shower in the bedroom. And this, as far as I'm concerned, is the number one reason to select this space over all of the others available on OnTrack. Having your own bathroom is great. That said, don't forget your toiletries. Amtrak only supplies towels and soap. And with that, I was settled in. Amtrak's flexible dining was on offer for this trip. We were able to try nearly every dish, so keep watching to see the Jeb Score award-winning Amtrak flexible dining dish of the year. I'll give you a hint, it's not the meatballs. As we made our way through the Chicago suburbs, we received some helpful Amtrak advice from the speakers above. The restroom, please make sure you flush the toilet. Once again, when you use the restroom, please make sure you lock the door behind you when you go in, flush the toilet. Only 30 minutes after leaving Chicago, we hit our first stop, Naperville. And with Naperville in our dust, I decided to head out and find the guys. Hello, you have Brooks. This is the Jeb. What's happening? You know, what amazes me is, you know, we've only been 30, 35 miles out of Chicago, right? And it's always getting to a fairly non-populated area. It just brings home the point of how expansive the United States is. And speaking of expansive... We're in a bedroom, and there's room for four uh, four grown guys kind of to hang out and, uh, as Sean grown. would say, chit-chat. Uh, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's actually pretty comfortable considering kind of what we've got here. A roommate, we'll take a look at that a little later. I think that's better suited for one of us uh, to be in at a time, but we'll try it out with as many people as we can fit into a roommate. We spent the next several hours just taking in the scenery, telling stories and jokes. We all agreed this was the most relaxed we'd been in a while. We marked landmarks like Interstate 35. We imagined what the menus were like at restaurants like family restaurant. But most of all, we just enjoyed each other's company. It's one of the great benefits of train travel. So those of you who've seen uh, my previous videos may know that I am a big fan of uh, consuming prunes uh, because the food on the train tends to uh, stop me up. Alan seems to be really offended at, at the idea of eating prunes, so let's find out why. It's time to prune up. We decided to move up to the observation car to take advantage of its more expansive views. That meant first passing through the dining car. More on that in a bit. Dinner's coming up soon. Seats in the observation car are available on a first-come, first-served basis, and they're available to everyone on the train, no matter which class of service you're in. That said, when the train got more full and the views more impressive, the conductor enforced a two-hour time limit in here. In the middle of the car, you'll find some stairs. If you head down, you'll find food and drinks available for purchase in the cafe. Just like the observation car, the cafe is open to everybody on the train. Galesburg marked our first fresh air break. This is always a highlight for me. It's the first stop that gives me my true impression of the scope of the train, and this was a big one. There were three coach cars, an observation car, a dining car, three sleepers, and two engines. It was huge. Time to hop on board. This was Galesburg. Traveling by train has this really strange power. It somehow warps time. 
What would seem like an eternity in the real world passes effortlessly on board. Here on Amtrak, it seems like time is marked mostly by meals. But there are certain landmarks that retain a significance that everyone on board appreciates. And along this route, there are several. The Rocky Mountains, the Moffat Tunnel, Donner Lake, and we'll see them all. But the first was crossing the mighty Mississippi. I've flown over this river more times than I can count, and I've always thought of it as a long river. It stretches 2,320 miles between Minnesota down to New Orleans, but it's also a massively wide river. And this train really highlighted that fact for me. It took us 90 seconds to get from one end of this bridge to the other. Crossing the Mississippi also marked the border between Illinois and Iowa. We just entered the second of seven states. Every stop tells a story. Mount Pleasant, Iowa, for example, is home to Iowa Wesleyan College, America's oldest co-educational college west of the Mississippi. Sleeping car passengers were invited to make dinner reservations with the dining car attendant. We'd set ours for 6.30, and as the sun got lower on the horizon, we headed up to eat. Dinner includes a small salad, some bread, a main course and a dessert. Here's the Asian noodle bowl, chicken fettuccine, and the ever-present meatballs. And to be honest, there's not a lot of difference between the three. Well, it's time for another meatball. Just like I remember. As we ate dinner, we passed through Ottumwa, Iowa. It's the home to actor and comedian Tom Arnold. After dinner, we headed back to Alan's bedroom to hang out a while longer. It was really great to have this space to ourselves. That was that was that was really cool. Just uh, caught a Swidden burn uh, yeah. as we were traveling through Iowa, which is uh, pretty impressive. This is one of the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen. I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, traveling in Amtrak really gives you the opportunity to uh, take in such beautiful views. And shortly after sunset, I headed back to my own bedroom for what I hoped would be a solid night's sleep. Tomorrow morning, I'll wake up, um, I guess, with an hour time difference and uh, hopefully uh, even more interesting scenery. So, time for bed. See you in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening once again. This is Johnny, your attendant here in the 531. Folks, I'll be leaving the car for my evening home. As I slept, we passed through Nebraska. I woke up about 5.15 mountain time near Brush, Colorado. <laughs> that was a great night's sleep. I feel really incredibly well rested. Slept almost all the way through the night. I look forward to a beautiful day today. Uh, I understand the views are gonna be incredible. Coffee should be ready in about uh, 45 minutes. We could get the day uh, started off right. As the sun crept up over the horizon, I decided to head over to the observation car to wait for that coffee. However, thankfully, our sleeping car attendant saw I was up early and offered to pour me a cup. I sure was grateful. Tipping room attendants is appreciated but not expected. Uh, but what do you think? What's an appropriate amount? Should you do it at the beginning or the end of a trip? Let me know below. As we made our way toward Denver, two things happened. First, we started seeing snow. And second, we headed to breakfast. Reservations were not required for breakfast. It was first come, first serve, and we were first. Breakfast of champions. The spinach, tomato, onion, mozzarella, provolone, and Parmesan breakfast omelet was new on the menu, and I can only describe it as uh, crunchy. We'd made it to Denver, but first had to reverse into the station. Now, this was also going to be a refueling and service stop for the train, which meant we'd be able to get off and stretch our legs. Welcome to Denver. We've got a little bit of a longer stop here on this effort, up to an hour, I think. So I'm going to go check out the station. Let's, uh, let's go explore.
Exciting to be here at the uh, Denver Union Station. Uh, apparently the real good stuff is about to kick off. Uh, amazing views the rest of the morning as we make our way up into the into the Rocky Mountains. And uh, had enough time to grab a quick uh, shot of espresso, so. Ah, man, that's good. All right, let's head back on board and get this show on the road. Fueled by that shot of espresso, I was ready to post up in the observation car for what would turn out to be some of the most amazing views I've ever seen in my whole life. Just take a sip, cover your lip, and enjoy your trip. We're here to help folks, but we got that policy that we need to enforce. And with that out of the way, let's leave the city behind and climb up into the Rocky Mountains. As I think back on this trip, it's the views we encountered here on the morning of our second day that really come to mind. I've driven through the Rockies, I, I've flown over the Rockies, but there's something about experiencing them from the train that's just different. In almost no time after departing Denver, the show began. It's no wonder so many passengers board in Denver for a day trip through this part of the country. I gotta tell you, I'm having so much fun just reliving this as I'm editing the video. I definitely hope you'll enjoy watching it too. And if you do, maybe you'd consider hitting that like button. Or maybe even subscribing for more videos like this. We encountered more tunnels than we could count. It was impossible not to think about the people who built this amazing track. This is mind-blowing, uh, what we're seeing out the window right here. It's almost as though it's not real because it's just so breathtaking. This has got to be the most scenic train in the United States by a mile. Because the train was so full, the conductor asked everyone to limit themselves to two hours in the observation car, and after about an hour and a half, we headed back to our rooms. And the views from there were equally impressive. There's no way around it. This is incredible. These are some of the most beautiful scenes I've ever, uh, I've ever seen anywhere on the planet, let alone from a train. I've mentioned in a previous video Traveling by train through weather is a really relaxing thing, and right now there's a little bit of a snowstorm going, and it's it's just uh, it's nice and comfortable to sit in here in this in this bedroom, kind of stretch out, have space to yourself, and uh, and drink it in. And I'm lucky enough to be able to hang out uh, with Sean. He's uh, he's uh, over there, and uh, we're just hanging out and uh, enjoying a little peaceful uh, relaxation. The impressive views would soon be cut though. Our conductor announced that we needed to remain where we were for the next 10 minutes or so because we were about to go through another landmark on this trip, the Moffat Tunnel. So I was just reading up on the Moffat Tunnel and it opened in 1928. It saved like uh, 176 miles off of the trip uh, between the Pacific and Denver, uh, which was unprofitable because the snow removal efforts were so complicated. I'm gonna show you now what it looks like as we're traveling through the Moffat Tunnel so that you can experience exactly what we're experiencing ourselves. And it went on like that for another 10 minutes. We had to remain where we were because opening doors between cars while in there would have allowed noxious fumes to get in and nobody's got time for that. Our next stop was Winter Park, where we had just enough time to get out and stand in the snow. What do you think of uh, Colorado? Snowing in April, love it. We found ourselves in Fraser Canyon, following the Fraser River. We made it to Granby, Colorado, the gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park. Just got an announcement. The train is, uh, I believe the conductor said, pretty dang near full. 
uh, with 200 passengers on board. It's really exciting to see Amtrak coming back. This is a wonderful way to see the country, a wonderful way to get across the country. Uh, so I think there are a lot of people who are here for the scenery, uh, even more people here because uh, they need to go somewhere. The snow turned to rain when we reached Gore Canyon, which offers the wildest commercially available whitewater in Colorado. I decided to pass on that and head to lunch instead. The only available reservation was at 2.30, so we opted to have lunch delivered to us about 11.30. Craig went for another new item on the menu, the cod. Sean tried the shrimp and lobster sauce, and it was the red wine braised beef for me. Based on Craig's enthusiasm for its flavor, it looks like the cod might need further investigation. Stand by. So this is the midpoint of the uh, journey here. We've made it uh, halfway, uh, halfway to San Francisco. This is Glenwood Canyon, a popular destination for outdoor sportsmen and apparently the anti-train crowd. Oh my gosh, look at this. They're mooning. <laughs> We just got the Zephyr Salute, uh, I believe, which is a, a greeting here uh, on the on the California Zephyr. Uh, I, I gotta tell you, not uh, not my favorite greeting, but I like these views. we'd reached the confluence of the Roaring Fork and Colorado Rivers at Glenwood Springs, which marked another opportunity to get off the train and stretch our legs. But it was not a long stop, and we were back on board, on our way to Grand Junction and the nearby Utah state line. Amtrak's California Zephyr takes its name from the original train that was operated jointly by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad, the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, and the Western Pacific Railroad. It was inaugurated March 19, 1949, and from its earliest days, the marketing and advertising for this route has focused on the spectacular views along the way. I think you can see why. In 1983, the original Zephyr's operators elected to join Amtrak, which eventually led to the train's current routing and service. After leaving Grand Junction, we were heading for Utah in the spectacular Ruby Canyon, whose red rocks impressed us as we searched for promised jackalopes among the bushes. Now, despite our best efforts, we never did see any of those rabbit-like animals with antlers. Dinner approached. Sean went with the chicken marsala, I chose the chicken fettuccine, and the cod grew in popularity with Alan jumping on the bandwagon and Craig opting for it a second time. Was this a fluke or a trend? More to come. And this was not to be a late night for me. Sadly, I slept through Utah and part of Nevada. But after a great long night's sleep, I woke up near Winnemucca, Nevada, about a quarter to six Pacific time, just as the sun was coming up, and like the day before, I headed straight for the observation car, stopping just long enough to get a cup of coffee. That was a really good night's sleep, actually. I, I slept uh, better than the night before, and um, now just kind of enjoying a little bit of coffee in the observation car. Sean's getting some work done, and uh, getting ready for breakfast in uh, just a few minutes. It's important to know there's no Wi-Fi available out here, so you're well served to use this trip as an opportunity to unplug and relax.
before we knew it, the sun was up and breakfast was on the table. I started with yogurt and followed it up with a breakfast sandwich. Both were exactly what you'd expect them to be, just fine. Craig chose the omelette and offered an interesting description. A little bit like a prison breakfast, not that I would know. And with questions still floating through my mind, I decided it was time to head back to my room. Well, Suzanne, your creative director, my fiance, is meeting us in San Francisco. So uh, that means it's time to do something I've never done before. This is the first time I've ever taken a shower on a train. Here goes nothing. Not only were the instructions intimidating, but the advice to try it seated was made even more unpleasant by the fact that the seat was a toilet. I secured the curtain, turned the knob, and nearly froze to death. This is really cold. Well, that was cramped and cold uh, and difficult, but I can now say I have successfully taken a shower on a train. I do feel a lot more refreshed and ready to go. So it's still morning. I mean, it's only uh, 7.35, and uh, we don't get into uh, Emeryville until uh, later in the afternoon, like 4 o'clock or so. so. Plenty more train to ride. I wondered how many of the passengers up there knew what they were missing out on down here. It was time for my first and only game of Euchre. And in a classic example of beginner's luck, I won. Our next stop was the biggest little city in the world, a station I'm sorry to say I found a little disappointing. I'd never been to Reno and would have loved to have seen at least a street or something, but this station is about 30 feet below and under threat of being left here forever, the conductor discouraged us from wandering too far. Oh well, there were some interesting historical artifacts inside. As we left, I asked to check out Sean's roomette. As you can see, with his bags, it's a little cramped. Now, there's also bag storage downstairs, just as an FYI. But we decided to invite Alan over to see how comfortable the two of them would be. It's not bad. It's no, really, I mean... your feet up, you're comfortable? Yeah, right. with one person, it's, it's yeah. outstanding. Since that seemed to work, why not try it with three people? I'll say this, uh, three it's people a in a roomette is a little bit, it's a little bit tight. Three, three, three grown men in, in a roomette. It's, it's probably a bit, a bit too much. Oh boy. And having gone our separate ways so we could breathe again, we were en route to the California border. First stop in the Golden State, Truckee. You know, I don't think there's anything quite as relaxing as uh, just listening to a good audiobook and uh, taking in the scenery. We're just passing through the, uh, the Donner Pass, which in the winter of 1846 into 47, um, the Donner Party came through here. Uh, they got stuck because of a number of factors, a bad winter, they left too late, they took a wrong turn, a lot of reasons. Unfortunately, uh, some of them um, who survived I had to resort to cannibalism. So it's a pretty grim chapter of US history. Anyway, it's interesting to be right here uh, in Donner Pass. We crept along at an interminable pace. Dragging this much machine up the Sierra Nevada is no easy task, but there's no need to rush it. With ever-changing views, the clip didn't really matter. It was soon time for lunch. The train was a lot emptier between Grand Junction and Emeryville, so we did not need a reservation. I've heard a lot about this pod, so this is the time. And I was not the only one. All four of us ordered it. Moment of truth. Mm. Tastes like a fish, fish sticks. And we have our winner. The Jeb Score Award winning Amtrak Flexible Dining Meal of the Year Award goes to the cod. We're slowly making our way uh, to Colfax, California, named for U.S. Grant's Vice President, Schuyler Colfax, little known fact there. And I really wish Amtrak would communicate with us about what's going on. I don't know if we're on time or we delayed. The track of train 
feature of the Amtrak website uh, seems to be down right now. So I'm kind of like not sure what the schedule is or what's going on. Um, so that would be really nice if Amtrak uh, were a bit more proactive with their communications. There's a big difference between this and the Southwest Chief, and that's this third day. So if you take the Southwest Chief from Chicago to uh, LA, you wake up on the third day pretty much in Los Angeles. With this particular train, however, you wake up on the third day, you have basically a whole rest of that day um, to pass because we don't get into uh, Emeryville if everything's on time until about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's a really, it's a much different uh, travel experience in that regard. You sort of have to remember to think about how you're gonna use today. Now I've had a nice time just kind of hanging out with my friends, napping a little bit and looking out the window. But this third day is a consideration if you're thinking about the Zephyr. If you don't want to spend 52 hours on board, I'd recommend hopping on the train in Denver for the ride up to Grand Junction. That's a real highlight, but we're not done yet. Before too long, the Sacramento skyline came into view and we got out to stretch our legs one final time. We seemed to be gaining speed or maybe Time felt like it was moving more quickly. Uh, for whatever reason, the Bay Area was coming fast. There's no doubt that the Zephyr lived up to its reputation as being the most scenic train in the United States. This journey has been breathtaking practically from the first second we left Chicago. The views have been unlike anything I've ever seen from a train. From the Great Plains to the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, I mean, here to the California, Northern California. It's just such a stunning journey. We've still got a little bit of time before we make our way into Emeryville and then on through to uh, San Francisco. The last few stops came quickly and I gathered my things. Here we are in Emeryville, last and final stop. Everybody's off here, let's go. Thanks to some incredible engineers and talented dispatchers, we arrived in Emeryville 40 minutes early. Getting into San Francisco requires booking an Amtrak bus or having your own separate transportation. After 52 hours and 19 minutes, we'd made it from Chicago to San Francisco and had an amazing adventure to boot. Between now and the next time, see you on the rails. Hey, hey, we're going on a train. You guys are really making some progress with their bags. Hopefully I'm a little bit more graceful. I'm reading up on the rules of Euchre because I know you're very really interested in the game that was developed in the Napoleonic era. And then goes past, starts with the bend of his elbow, goes past his fingers. Have you ever seen a ba baby pigeon? If you have, would you please leave a comment below? Time to get on board. This is Galesburg. Did you say Des Moines? <laughs> oh, I thought they were supposed to be pitted, uh, but there's not a lot to see. So instead you're looking at me, you lucky bastards. So this is Grand Mesa. Uh, this is Grand Mesa, the world's uh, highest flat top mountain. There's no way to be sure, but uh, Alan seems to think that's Grand Mesa. Uh, but he said that about every Mesa we've passed. But uh, I think at this point, at this point, we're gonna go with that's Grand Mesa. You know, I don't think that was a great nap. A huge uh, shout out and thank you to Alan, Craig, and Sean for joining me on this trip. And an even bigger thank you to you for watching all the way to the end. This was my most ambitious project ever. It started with five and a half hours of content and to distill it down to this was an incredible challenge, but so much fun. Let me know what you think. And between now and the next time, see you on the rails.